My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Familiar, turn to a familiar passage tonight if you would, it's Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. Now, Harvey, you joined the church this morning and then you backslide six rows. How's that happen? <laughs> you're always in the second row down here and uh, now you're back there. Luke 2. It's, this is the familiar, what is known as the Christmas story in the Bible. And uh, we're going to read this together this evening. Uh, the first 14 verses of Luke chapter 2. And uh, let's do this, let's stand together to read the scripture, and we'll all stand and read Luke 2, and we'll read it, we'll begin together on verse 1, and I'll read 2, and we'll alternate reading until we get to verse number 14, all right? Let's begin on verse 1, ready? And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And they were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, let's read 14 also, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. Thank you, Father, for recording this for us and the word of God that we have an opportunity to experience a little bit of what happened that night Christ was born. And Lord, as we want to glean just three simple principles, life lessons, if you will, that we can glean from people surrounding the birth of Christ, I pray that you would minister to our hearts tonight as only you can. And that, Father, we would keep the Christ in the center of Christmas and not conform to the world who seems to want to push him out. And so, Father, focus our minds, our hearts, our attention tonight upon the truths from your word, and may it help us make a difference as we keep Christ where he belongs in Christmas time. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. All right, be seated if you will. As Christians, we celebrate the birth of Christ and... There is no command in the Bible to do so, uh, but any opportunity we have to celebrate the birth of Christ, we ought to do that, or anything about Christ, whether it's His birth, or His death, or His resurrection, or His ascension, or 
His second coming, anything that has to do with Jesus Christ, we ought to be happy that we can celebrate that. Uh, and we do so at Christmas time. Jesus comes and He brings hope. He brings forgiveness. But let's remember, He came to change people's lives. You know, one of the, one of the famous things at Christmas time is uh, the movie called A Christmas Carol which familiarizes us with a character named Ebenezer Scrooge. And he lived a miser pretty miserable life of greed and selfishness. And you know the story. He wakes from his sleep by a ghost and the ghosts of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas future. But he, Scrooge begins to see his life for what it really was. A very bitter empty, lonely life. And as he sees it unfold, he has a change of his heart and he wants his life to be different than what it was. And so he retraces his steps and he sees the offenses that he's committed through the years and as he does so, he gets a change of heart. And he promises that life will be different from that point forward. In fact, he makes this statement, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me and I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. And all of a sudden, Scrooge is transformed from a bah humbug to a hallelujah. He's giving things away and helping people out and will pay for Tiny Tim's surgery, and he'll do, he's doing everything he can to show that he's a new man. And I'd like to tell you that it isn't the visit from some spirit's past or some ghost of a past Christmas that changes anybody's life. What changes people's hearts and what will change their life is really meeting Jesus Christ. He is the one that changes our lives. You know, I'm thinking of the wise men who visited not the babe in the manger, but a young child, as Matthew tells us. But you know, when they left, the Bible says in there in Matthew that they went home a different way. And you know, whenever you come to Jesus Christ and you truly come to know Him as your Savior, you don't leave the same as you came. You leave differently than when you came. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, old things are passed away and all things are become new. And I'm not going to keep you long this evening. I just want to share three life lessons from some people surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ. And three life lessons that will help us. The first ones we look at are found in Luke chapter 1. You're in Luke 2. Luke chapter 1. And we find out in verse number 5 that there was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments of the ordinance of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they, were both, they, they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Now as he goes on to talk about John, Zacharias talks to the angel, verse 18. Zacharias said to the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God. And am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings, 
And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou hast because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Here's Zacharias the priest, his wife Elizabeth, faithful followers of the Lord, blameless, not by anybody's standards, but God making that comment about them. It's not said of many people in the Bible. And here they've been praying for probably most of their married life to have a child. But they had no child. No children ever came. No answers to prayer. To have a child in Bible days was considered to be blessed by God. Uh, if you were barren, you, you, you really prayed that you could have a child. You remember Hannah prayed earnestly and God gave her Samuel as well as some other children. And so they wanted the blessing of the Lord, but the years rolled by, the years passed by, no child. Zacharias is going about his business in the temple. I don't know if they have recently had thought about a child or not. I don't know if they had discussed it. I don't know if they had just prayed for many years and now they have not prayed. I'm sure they had conversations through the years saying, I wonder why God never answered our prayer. I wondered why we never were blessed with not just children, but even a child. God didn't see fit to hear that prayer. But while he's offering this, doing his duties in the temple, and he is going about his business that he does in the temple, offering prayer at the altar, an angel appears. Gabriel. And he says, your prayer has been heard. And you're going to have a son. Well, your wife is. <laughs> That'd have been news, wouldn't it? And Zechariah can't believe it. He goes, How can this be? We're both old. We're, 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 well, he didn't say he was old. He just said his wife was, he said he was old and his wife was well stricken in years. And he said, How is that possible? And I love what the angel said. He said, I'm Gabriel. I, I stand in the presence of God. And you're asking me, how is this possible? <laughs> With God, what? All things are possible. Don't, remember who's talking to you here, Zacharias. Here he has been praying for years, and now the Lord announces your prayer is going to be answered. And then he doubts whether it's really answered or not. And of course, he says, here's going to be your sign. You're not going to be able to say anything until the baby is born. Nine months of silence for Zacharias. I'm sure that became the talk of the town. He came out and he couldn't say anything. And any time he wrote, you'll find out later on, once the child was born, they wanted to call him after his father. And his mother said, no, his name will be John. And they thought, well, we'll ask Dad about this. You know, certainly he'll want Zach Jr. to be in the family. And they said, what will be his name? And he got a pad for, he called for the, uh, 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 I don't know if they had a pad of paper back then or not, but they must have called for a stone. And <laughs> he, he wrote on there a tablet. You know what he wrote? His name will be John. And when he did that, then his tongue was loosed and he was able to talk. Could imagine, you imagine as they walk through the city, old Zechariah and Elizabeth. It doesn't say how old they were, but they were well past having children. Okay, I, I don't know uh, what age they were. Maybe they were seventy-one. Maybe it was like Bob and Kay Wallace. Can you imagine what you would you would feel like if if Bob Wallace announced Wednesday night, I have an announcement to make, and he said, uh, my wife and I are going to have a child. There would be a gasp go across the crowd. You know? <laughs> but can you imagine that it really was true, and they had a birth, and can you imagine now, uh, nine months gone by, ten months, eleven months, twelve months, the baby's two, three months old, and you walk into church, and there's Kay carrying their baby. Bob walking around with... with with marks on his suit from where the baby spit up on him, you know. <laughs> the badge of honor for every young father. Hmm? And, and everybody would say, isn't that amazing? 
What a, what a miraculous thing God did there. You imagine, it, it would have been no different had they talked that way about Zechariah and Elizabeth. It was unbelievable. And they would talk about what an amazing testimony that was. That John was a miracle child. He was a miracle baby. But the principle I want to give from this, from Zechariah and Elizabeth was, never give up praying. I don't know how many years, they, if, they're, if they're past childbearing years, uh, let, let's, say they were, let's say they were 60. I'm sure that they've probably been praying since they were probably in their late teens or 20 years old in those days. 30 years, 40 years. The tragedy of our generation and in our culture that we're in, when we say, well, I really prayed about it, that usually means we talk to God about it once or twice. There's very few people that would say, I prayed years for this, and, and really mean that. There's very few that understand how much persevering in prayer really means. But God answers prayer. But God answers prayer on His timetable and not ours. We, we are very... Um, in, uh, we're all about instant gratification in America. None of us like to wait. You know, I, one of the men at Madison the other morning talked about prayer. Um, it was, uh, where's Kevin? Back here. It was Samuel Afalabi. And Samuel was saying how he's learned, the, he's the one who stood up and said, worry is gone. I used to worry every day. What about this? What about this? I need to do this. What if I don't get this done? He said, now there's no worry. Everything is in God's hands. And I trust Him. And he talked about prayer. And now he commits things to prayer. And he said, you can be sure when, when there's no answer to prayer, he said, you can be sure God is still working. And that's true. But you understand this. When there's no answer to prayer... What God is working on sometimes is you and me. He's waiting for, to prepare us to be ready to get the answer to prayer. Maybe it's the fact we want it, but He knows we're not ready to handle that yet. So He waits. But we're to keep on praying. And here John the Baptist comes, the miracle boy, the preacher that prepared the way for the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You understand you're not a self-made person. We're all a God-made person. Whatever you are tonight is attributed to God, not yourself. You start thinking you can do anything and I did this myself. Uh, who lets you get out of bed in the morning? God could lay you out flat anytime He wants to. It makes it impossible for you to do anything. John Rockefeller Sr. is an example of somebody who reached the end of himself before he could get a proper perspective on life. Rockefeller had one ambition in life, and that was to make money. In fact, he, he wanted to be a millionaire, and by age 33, he made his first million. At age 43, he controlled the biggest company in the world at the time. At age 53... He was the richest man on earth and the world's only billionaire. But he developed a disease. A disease that caused all his hair to fall out. Xavier, are you okay? All right. Check. Not only did his hair fall out, his eyelashes fell out, his eyebrows disappeared, he became skin and bones. He had a weekly income of one million dollars, but all he could eat was milk and crackers. He was so hated in Pennsylvania, he had to have bodyguards day and night. He didn't sleep, he didn't smile, he didn't enjoy life at all. The doctors predicted he had one year to live. One newspaper had already written his obituary up in advance. 
so we'd be ready to go. One sleepless night, John Rockefeller came to his senses and realized that he could not take one dime with him into eternity. And he accepted, finally, the fact that money isn't everything. By the time he got up the next morning, it is told he was a changed man. He began to help churches with his wealth. He established the Rockefeller Foundation. They funded medical research that led to the discovery of penicillin. John D. Rockefeller began to sleep well. He began to eat again. He began to enjoy life. He didn't die at age 54. He died at age 98. Don't give up on prayer. George Mueller was a great man of faith and prayed in millions of dollars to take care of orphans in his orphanages and his schools. And George Mueller had three brothers who were not saved and two of them got saved in his lifetime and he prayed for 52 years for his third brother to come to know Christ as his Savior. Mueller died and at his funeral, his third brother received Christ as his Savior. 52 years he prayed for him. Don't give up on prayer. What, what prayer is it that you stop praying? Because you figure God isn't answering. What, 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 what prayer is it that you said, well, I'm not praying that anymore. It's been three weeks, it's been a month, it's been a year. No one is praying that anymore. Never give up on prayer. The second principle is in the life of Mary and Joseph. Also in Luke chapter 1. If you notice with me down to Verse number 27, or actually 26, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So he greets her with this kind of incredible news. <laughs> that she's highly favored among women of her day and she's going to bear the Christ child. Conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. He would be 100% man, but 100% God. Devoted to His Heavenly Father. He'd take upon Him the sins of the world and die on the cross for the sins of mankind. That He not only would defeat Satan and the penalty of sin, but he defeats Satan and the power of sin over men's lives. And Mary said, Be it unto me according to thy word. Verse number 38. Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. She said, I don't know how it's possible, but may it be unto me just like you said, Gabriel. Mary responds with faith. The second principle I want you to learn or life lesson is we're to live our lives by faith. Mary had to, Mary had to believe the angel. Just like Zacharias did, Mary has to believe that. Knowing, you understand how difficult that would be to convince somebody? Talked to the guys at the prison today and we spoke about this. You know, you, how are you going to convince somebody 
I'm a, I'm a virgin and I'm expecting. How's that work? Who would believe that? That's what Mary's faced with. She believed what the angel said. And the angel reminded her, before she said, be it unto me according to thy word, before verse 38 is verse 37, what's verse 37 say, church? <laughs> For with God, nothing shall be impossible. She had to have great faith and trust in God and what he said to her, because she would undergo some certain scrutiny and rejection from the world. The great news is, Joseph didn't act in a harsh way either, or in a hasty way. Matthew says, Joseph took time to think about this. That's always a good thing to do. While he thought on it, he had a dream and... God revealed to him in a dream that he said, that, that which you conceived in Mary is of me. And don't fear to take her to be your wife. And so he did. By faith. The Bible says we're to walk by faith and not by sight. One night a house caught fire. And a young boy was forced to flee to the roof of the house. The father stood on the ground below with his arms outstretched. said, jump and I'll catch you. Jump and I'll catch you. He knew the boy had to jump in order to save his life. But all the boy could see was the flames and the blackness of the night and the smoke. And he was afraid to leave the roof. And the father kept yelling, jump son, jump. Jump son, jump. And the little boy protested and said, Daddy, I can't see you. Daddy, I can't see you. Oh, but the daddy said, Son, I can see you. I can see you. And that's all that matters. You understand that? There's times we have to jump. And you say, God, I can't see. I can't see where I'm going to land. I can't see what I'm supposed to do. God says, I see. And that's all that matters. As long as he sees. I don't know about tomorrow, but I know who holds my hand. He knows about tomorrow. I'm told the African Impala can jump to a height of over 10 feet and cover a distance of more than 30 feet. Yet those creatures can be contained in an enclosure in a zoo with a three-foot wall. Say, so how is that possible? Because those animals will not jump if they can't see where their feet are going to land. How many Christians live that way? You won't jump, you won't step out unless you can see how it's going to land and see how it's going to work out. Mary and Joseph had no idea how it was going to work out. And no idea what it was going to look like. But they took that step of faith anyway. With God, all things are possible. I wonder how many times they repeated that to each other in nine months' time before the baby was born. When family would have rejected them. When others would have ostracized them. and had nothing to do with them. Yeah, sure, Joseph, sure. Yeah, she's, she's expecting from God. <laughs> and I've heard them all. I'm sure they went through it all, and I'm sure there's many a night they said, with God, all things are possible. Live your life by faith. Never give up on prayer, Zachariah and Elizabeth. Live your life by faith, Mary and Joseph. The third principle comes from chapter 2. And these are the people who the angels announced the birth of Jesus to. Mary brings forth her firstborn son. In verse number 8 of chapter 2, it says, They were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord, that's not his name, that's just the Bible speaking that 
you don't call him low. But uh, he's the angel of the Lord. He came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then, of course, there's suddenly with that angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now verse 15 said, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and they found Joseph and Mary in the babe. I don't know about you, but if I was a shepherd out in the field, taking care of the sheep, watching over the flock, and all of a sudden there's an angel that appears in heaven, and then a whole host of angels in heaven, and they make this grand announcement that a Savior is born, and uh, you find them in Bethlehem, and all of a sudden, boom, they're gone. I probably would have looked at the other guy and said, did you see what I saw? Did we really see that? Did I, did I have too many anchovies on my pizza? Did this really take place? You, you, you'd, you'd wonder, am I dreaming this? They didn't think that at all. They immediately went to where the child was. Now notice what, it, what happened. They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned. What were they doing, church? Glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. They went home different than when they came. Now they're glorifying and praising God for what they'd been able to see. I, I think this is a song. It might be a poem. I don't know. It's called Nothing Ever Happens to a Shepherd. And it goes like this. It's cold out tonight in this God-forsaken place. And we're stuck here with a thousand sheep while life is exciting everywhere else, the highlight of our day is sleep. Shepherds are notorious for making little profit. We garner just enough for room and board. While everyone else wallows in their wealth, we're financially ignored. It's lonely out here in this isolated job. Our position is without esteem. We're socially challenged. We're society's outcasts. We're not exactly every woman's dream. Shepherds have a humble purpose. Of our fate, few people really care. Sometimes I wonder if God knows that we exist. If He does, I'm certain He's forgotten where. Nothing ever happens to a shepherd. Life is as boring as boring can be. While exciting things occur all over the world, nothing ever happens to me. Nothing ever happens to me. Maybe they were singing that song that night when all of a sudden, wah! <laughs> they think, wow. Understand, shepherds were the outcasts of society. Their testimony was not admissible in court. No one would listen to the shepherds. That's who God gave the announcement to. Pretty amazing. No one but God would be interested in shepherds. It had to be God. They're not religious. They were on the same level as prostitutes or habitual sinners, barred from the synagogue. But an angel appeared to the shepherds. The shepherds found the baby and the manger, just as the angel said. And they returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they'd seen. The shepherds were transformed to praising the Lord because of what they'd seen. They rejoiced. Now think about it. Now they could say, shepherds are famous. We saw the Christ child. We were the first to see the Christ child. We were the first 
to get the announcement. We were the first to see Him in the manger. The Messiah. The newborn King. How famous are they? Well, it's 2,000 years later and we're still talking about Him. How famous are they? God wrote about them in the Scripture. They're included in the Christmas story. I think we learn from the shepherds that we ought to live a life committed to praise of the Lord. The Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. You know, your life can be changed completely if you learn to praise God. And just in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And learn to praise and give thanks to God. Three lessons, three life lessons from three different groups of people in the Christmas story. Zachariah and Elizabeth never give up on prayer. From Mary and Joseph were to live a life of faith. Just believe God. Have faith in God. Take Him at His word. And then from the shepherds, we live a life committed to praising the Lord. Praising the Lord. That, that'll keep us focused on what Christmas is really all about. I'm amazed at what great lengths the world goes to to keep Christ out of Christmas. I, I you know, you, you try to... Do you like Christmas music? Do you listen to that? Some of the radio stations play it all the time from Thanksgiving on through Christmas. You know what's discouraging? So many of them go out of the way not to play any of the songs you just heard sung tonight. It's all about Frosty and Rudolph and, and Baby It's Cold Outside and all these other songs. And they go to great lengths not to... Do you ever hear Silent Night? Oh, come all ye faithful. Angels we have heard on high. They're absent. Let's, if, if we don't keep Christ there, who's going to do it? That's our responsibility. Okay? Let's not conform to the world. Let's be transformed. And let's keep Christ where He belongs and keep Christmas focused on who it's all about, not just what it's all about. Let's make sure that we don't give up on prayer. We live by faith and we're committed to praise. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the simple truths tonight that we looked at from these folks surrounding the birth of Jesus. Father, I pray that tonight you've spoken to hearts. I suppose, God, that every one of us would have to admit there's times that we grew weary in prayer not receiving what we ask for, and so we just stopped praying for it. And we did not continue to be importunate, have importunity, continual asking for what we were praying for. And you wanted to answer, and you were willing to answer, but you were waiting for the answer to that prayer. Maybe we weren't ready to receive it. Maybe the time wasn't right for you to receive the glory for it. But maybe tonight there'd be some Christians here who would say, you know, I, there's a prayer that I need to get to praying again. Maybe it's for a lost loved one, for a family member, someone who we've given up on. Help us to never give up on prayer. Help us to know, Lord, that we're to live by faith. There's some here tonight that they know what you want them to do. They, they, they've been impressed by you and your word and your spirit about what they ought to do and a step of faith in their life, but they can't see where their feet are going to land and they're hesitant to jump. Help them to walk by faith and not by sight. Help us all to live a life committed to praising the Lord. I believe it's in Isaiah, your word says, you inhabit the praises of your people. 
Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness, for His wonderful works to the children of men. Help us be that kind of a people, God. I pray you've spoken to our hearts tonight.